Back here inside of Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium, 1372 show, the QB and the OG, Jim Ballard. I'm TJ Downing, and we got the NFL Alumni Academy going on back here behind us. Jim, talk about some of these coaches that have come out here to help some of these young guys that are still trying to get their shot at an NFL roster. I got a chance to spend some time down there with Mike Tice. I mean, they're working combo blocks. They're doing some intricate stuff, and obviously kind of working some new stuff as well. I mean, Mike Tice is a guy who played a long time in the NFL, coached a long time in the NFL, but as we know, the game has kind of changed, so you, you see different philosophies and how they kind of meet. It was interesting to hear Mike talk about, listen, what I may teach you here may not be what they try and teach you at the place you land at, because they're expecting all of these guys to hit a roster at some point throughout uh, the long NFL season. But, um, you know, you got a chance to see some of these coaches working down here on the other end with the players, and there are different philosophies, but at the end of the day, the game is still the same. I mean, you line up, you block, and you execute. Yeah, you got to get to the ball. I mean, we got defensive linemen back here working with Coach Smith, and the one thing that I found fascinating, TJ, was he was talking about how you get to the pass rusher. You know, he, he was he was walking guys at 10 yards, and he's like, yeah, you need a good five-yard sprint. You need a good 10-yard sprint. And then he kept pushing it out, pushing it out. He's like, he got to 40 yards. He goes, you could be an unbelievable athlete that ran an unbelievable 40-yard dash, but I've never seen a quarterback get sacked at 40 yards. So he's talking about the get off. He's talking about the players that are able to get sacks. And the one thing he was talking about, TJ, because of the evolution of the game, is how you pass rush and how you position yourself with all the RPO stuff that's going on in today's game. You know, you might not rush up the field as much because the pass is coming out a lot quicker. So a lot of different uh, strategies, a lot of philosophies, a lot of great learning for these young guys to come in here and be able to, to gain that experience to be, to be with guys like Coach Tice and Coach Carthon who's working with the running backs. And, um, you know, for them to be able to be ingrained and to hear them and, and to work through their drills and be coached by these guys, it's, it's the second best thing that you can get. You know, as you said, we have we had NFL Europe back in the day. Brad and I did. A lot of great players were able to, to utilize that and get a lot of experience. And for these guys to be able to come into Canton and put film out every day to go through drill work with these with these guys that have spent so much time in the NFL, it's just it's, in, it's invaluable. It's, it's, it's awesome to see, and it's, it's in our backyard. Yeah. When you talk about adapting, I mean, back when you played, back when you and Brad were over there in London. I mean, RPO hadn't even really been born yet. It was, uh, it, I don't want to say a foreign concept because you guys just weren't really doing those things. That's the evolution of the game and allowing these players to come in here and kind of learn that and kind of dial in a little bit better. You know, listen, let's, let's be honest here. Um, you were a guy that your skill set went into a system at times where we had to change it. It didn't work. You know, you're not a running quarterback. You're a pocket passing quarterback. You know, myself, I was I was a run game first guy, and then we developed into a spread offense, and then you're putting a lot of pressure on guys to know how to pass block, and pass blocking is one of the hardest things to do in the game. We're going to get a chance to hear from Mike Ken, who did did it for 17 years. One and, of the best, and, who's not and, and, in the Hall of Fame. Exactly. We, we need to find him a spot right over there, because and, if and, anybody and, belongs in there that's not, it's Mike Ken. You know, and, and he came from a situation in Michigan where they were lining up in the stack eye. They had 4,000-yard rushers. You know, they may they may have thrown the ball 10, 15 times at most a game, and then you get into the NFL and you're blocking for a guy like Bartkowski, and, and you're and you're doing a run and shoot, and you're throwing the ball around, and you know to to be able to say that you kept Lawrence Taylor from getting zero sacks, and you locked down a guy like Pat Swilling, who was the NFL Defensive Player of the Year, and guys like Charles Haley and Bruce Smith and Derek Thomas. I mean, the list goes on. To be able to say, okay, I was a run first guy coming out of college. They drafted me with the 13th overall pick in the first round, and now they're like, hey, you got a pass for tap. That's get on not that an easy thing to do. No, it's not, especially if you're playing that tackle position and yeah. you're on that island and you know you got that defensive end of that wide nine, that, that rush and rush end or outside linebacker coming up, man. You gotta oh, kick it, step it, and turn, turn get, around the, real quick. get that outside you see arm. What this blind side looks like over here. You never got hit. You, your back's a little soft, man. You never got hit back there before. You must have some good left tackles. <laughs> I did, I was fortunate. But uh yeah, talk about being on an island and uh, having to uh, adapt to the, the different philosophies and different uh, concepts of the game, and Mike was able to do that. And you know, we, we continue to see the game evolve. I mean, you, we hardly talk about running backs anymore or the run game. I mean, yeah. everything is so geared towards scoring points. Uh, defensively, it's a lot harder to cover, so you're throwing the ball a lot more because it's easier to get penalties. And now, if you do have a running back, you know, like the Browns with Kareem Hunt and, and Nick Chubb where you can run some of that RPO stuff, man, does it put a strain on those linebackers and those safeties. And it makes the offensive line job 
little bit easier. Yep, first week of the NFL Alumni Academy here inside of Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium, a partnership between the NFL Alumni Association and the NFL Alumni Academy with the Hall of Fame Village powered by Johnson Controls. It's going on right here. New headquarters is going to be over there in the Constellation Center for Excellence. We're going to get a chance to catch up with Ann Graff as we are on location down at the Corey Golf and Event Center. Jim, myself, and her uh, talked about a lot of different topics going on here uh, within uh, development, phase two, starting to close down. and getting ready to start building more assets. So we're gonna hear from Mike Ken, we're gonna hear from Ann Graffis, and we're gonna get you some videos out here, some clips of what's been going on out here with these players, these coaches, as they get ready for their chance to make an NFL roster before the end of the 2021-22 season. More from us here on the 1372 Show. Check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and SoundCloud for all your previous episodes. And staying up to date on everything going on here, football, inside of Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium and on the grounds of the Hall of Fame Village, powered by Johnson Controls. More after this. At CH Vallis & Associates, we've been proudly serving the greater Stark County community for over 78 years. Locally owned, we cover your home, auto, business, and life insurance, along with your group benefits. Our partnership with auto owners has allowed us to span not only Ohio, but throughout the entire country. Did you know that auto owners, an A++ rated company by AM Best, and a Fortune 500 company, has ranked CH Vallis & Associates a top 10 insurance agency in the state of Ohio? From your basic home and auto needs to insuring some of the largest companies in America, there's a reason people choose CH Vallis and Associates and auto owners. Our dedication and passion for our clients and their coverage is part of our commitment to excellence. For all your insurance coverage needs, there's only one call to make, and that's CH Vallis and Associates, located at 1302 South Main Street in North Canton. Contact us at 330 494 2776 today and see the difference in customer satisfaction. in high school to have a very, very influential head coach in the, in the his name was Mernie Lazier. And he actually prepared me to, um, let's say, succeed under Bo Schembechler, which the combination of those two set the foundation for me to excel in the NFL. But when I was in high school, yeah, I was a late bloomer. Uh, when I was a senior, I was six foot six and I only weighed 192 pounds. I played offensive tackle and defensive end. In fact, I never left the field. The only time I left the field was at halftime, which is kind of a good thing because the coach never had a chance to yell at you because you were on the field all the time because I played every special teams. But I got probably 15 or 20 letters of interest from colleges. But the only place that I ever got a, an actual invite from was uh, Arizona. And I went down to Arizona and then I got an invite to Michigan and was recruited there because uh, Elliot Uzelak, uh, who was the uh, offensive tackle and tight end coach, along with Jerry Hanlon as the offensive line coach, he came and saw me at Evanston and watched me play lacrosse. And he basically told Bo, he said, you should see this kid run and wait till he grows into the size of his feet. So... <laughs> But so I went to Arizona, first time I was ever, oh, oh. I need to turn it on silence, an early phone call. So I went to Arizona and I really loved it because uh, I was there in February, walking down the stairs off of the plane. Uh, you know, it was 85 degrees in February and I had my winter coat man, and I really loved the place. But they didn't offer me a scholarship on the spot. So then I went to Michigan and they didn't offer me a scholarship on the spot. And that's the only two trips I, I, I was invited to. And even Bob Blackman in University of Illinois told me to my face when he came to visit me at school is that you're never going to play Big Ten football. And, the, and people would come to see me at Evanston High School and say, you're not the kid we saw on film. I go, yeah, I am. He said, no, you look like a basketball player. I go, well, yeah, I was a light. So I actually then, um, my head coach, Mernie Lazier, and the student counselor got me a meeting at uh, um, a recruiting trip to the University of Cincinnati, <clears throat> like six weeks after the letters of intent actually came out. I went down there for a visit, and I absolutely hated it. I said, I can't go to school here. You know, and I told my dad, I said, Dad, you know, I know we can't afford to send me to college. 
I said, they offered me a scholarship on the spot. I told them I needed to talk to you, but then I, I hated the place. I wouldn't, I, I don't, don't want to go. I'm sorry. He said, son, don't worry about it. I said, maybe I'll go to a, a junior college or something like that. Well, then all of a sudden, I get a phone call from the University of Arizona. And, you know, I'm sitting in the kitchen early in the morning eating breakfast with my mom, and it's University of Arizona, and they offered me a scholarship. I was ecstatic, but they had conditions based on it. They said, you have to promise me that if you accept this, that you're not going to break your word, and uh, and you're going to not break your word, and you're going to go and keep your commitment. I said, absolutely. Got off the phone. Guy says, I'm getting on a plane. I'll call you from O'Hare Field when I get there. And <clears throat> you can tell me how to get to your house. Got off the phone. You know, was ecstatic. Told my mom she was happy and everything. A couple hours later, the phone rings and it's Bo. And Bo says, we want to offer you a scholarship to be a Michigan Wolverine. I went, I'm thinking to myself, oh, crap. Just, I'm 18 years old. I just made, gave my word to University of Arizona. I said, what am I going to do? But I always wanted to go to Michigan for some reason. So at 18 years old, and I've been raised in a way that, you know, you don't break your word and everything like that. I go to Bo, I said, well, there's a problem. Bo goes, typical Bo, what do you mean? You don't want to be a Michigan Wolverine? <laughs> I, go, I go, yes, I do, coach. I want to be a Michigan Wolverine. He goes, all right, that's that and everything like that. I hang up the phone. I go, I go, holy crap, mom, I just broke my word. And I was really proclaimed about it. And, and then a couple hours later, the guy from Arizona, you know, gets off the plane on, uh, at O'Hare and he calls me up and goes, uh, all right, I'm here. How do I get to your house? I said, well, there's a problem. He said, what's the problem? He says, you know, a couple hours after you called, uh, Bo Schembecker called me in Michigan, offered me a scholarship and I accepted. He read me the riot act, swearing everything like this <laughs> and everything and he hung up the phone. And I went, now I feel even worse. And I go, holy crap. And then five minutes later, the phone rings again. It's the head coach of the University of Arizona, Arizona reading me the riot act and swearing at me and everything and hanging up the phone on me. I felt really bad about it until I finally got older and understand that this is a business. You know, this exactly. Is, this is not a unilateral contract. It's bilateral. They can go ahead and, and, and take it away. Why can't I take it away? But what I found out happened because, you know, Coach Mallory at Arizona used to be the defensive coordinator at Michigan. And he was the head coach of Arizona. Supposedly, Michigan and Arizona were waiting, had both had a scholarship, and they were trying to get this quarterback to sign with them, with them. And the quarterback decided to go someplace else. So said, okay, let's go take the Ken kid because Arizona and Michigan wanted me. And Michigan knew Arizona wanted me. So that's how the whole thing played out. So that's how I ended up in Michigan. So then what happened is in uh, my freshman year with your dad, um uh i dislocated my elbow and like the first week of training camp so i was out and, and freshmen couldn't start back there anyway right and I, yeah and i even lost more weight and i was in a bad way and then i almost failed school i think i got uh, a c and four d's Bo pulled me into the office you know after the season and uh he says you know i guess you're not going to be playing michigan football next year and he goes what are you talking about? Bo? He says, well, you've got a 1.2 grade point average. He says, if you, and in the big 10 here, I think if you got to have a 2.0 or 2.2, I think the NCAA is 1.8. He says, if you don't get your grades up in the next semester, you're not going to be playing football this next year. Well, okay. The next semester happened and I ended up getting a, applied myself and got a 3.8, brought it up to two, went home that summer. And then I called, that's the summer that my nuts dropped. And, <laughs> and I started working out at the Chicago Fitness Club with a former Mr. Olympia called Sergio Oliva, who basically taught me how to lift weights. And I put on 45 pounds in one summer. <laughs> so, so I went from 202 pounds to like 255 pounds, maybe 3% body fat and, you know, reported back to Michigan in the fall and walked into the coaches meeting room and all the coaches were there Bo's at the end of the table and uh I got a I got a well the week, uh, white beater 
Dago T on it. We call them Dago T's. I don't want to be, you know, we can't say all those things these days. When I'm 65, I can just say whatever the hell I want. <laughs> uh, and I had cut off jean shorts on, and Bo goes, Ken? Ken, is that you? <laughs> yeah, coach, it's me. What have you been doing? Lifting weights. <laughs> He goes, oh, damn, you look great. Good to see you. You know, left the room. So at the first game, uh, Steve King, the, the five, fifth-year senior uh, offensive tackle, uh, uh, blew his knee out. And and so he was out. And I, I wasn't dressing for the game. And then they approached me Monday or Sunday after film session and said, all right, Ken, you're starting next week. Well, I'm going to go back to my opening statement that Marine Lazier prepared me for Bo Schembechler. You know, we did full speed, full contact um, practices with Bo. I mean, they're some of the hardest practices I've ever been in. In fact, we used to two platoon the offenses is that I hated the guys who were on the defensive show team because we would have two huddles going at once. And so the first offense would run a play while the second offense was calling a play. We would finish that play. We'd go back in a huddle and the second offense would come up and run another play. So I feel real bad for the defensive show team because they were getting wore out. But, you know, we did one-on-one -on -one drive blocks. We did one-on-one -on -one drive blocks coming out of the chutes with a two by 10 board between our mm. legs. I mean, it, it was absolutely brutal. It's old school to the D, man. Oh, it was. And, uh, but, you know, the, uh, the practices that we had at Edison under Myrna Lazier were just as hard. So I wasn't unfamiliar with it. But, yeah, we lost, a, a, I don't know, eight or ten guys from our recruiting class uh, left. They just left. I think we had a total of 30 because back then you could have 30. So we ended up, I think, you're right, 13 people survived our freshman class and your dad was one of them yeah i heard on the uh, the show that you did um with some of the guys and, and i have to think that uh walt being a little bit of a trickster uh crossed out on the sign those who say will be champions but those who say will play <laughs> that is correct and i'm pretty sure your dad do that because it was a sign that was hanging above the door there and he crossed it out and said those who say will play yeah so we were the I guess the chosen few or the survivors. You guys had four 1,000-yard rushers. Harlan Huckleby, Russell Davis, um, your your quarterback, uh, Rick Leach, and then Rob Lytle, rest in heaven, Rob. Um, but to have four guys do that, man, the offense you guys ran, I mean, you guys all have to be on point and clicking to be able to pull that off. Well, we ran an I option, okay? It's not a wishbone option, but we ran the option out of the I formation. And, you know, it was kind of fit Bo's personality, you know. Bo would say, he says, you know, you can go ahead and tell him where we're running and we're still going to kick their ass. <laughs> you know, so. See if you can Jerry stop it. Hamlin, yeah, he says, and Jerry Hamlin was uh, the most technical and fundamental uh, coach, uh, offensive line coach that I ever had. And he basically set the foundation for me to be taken to the next level in uh, in the nfl because of the techniques and fundamentals that he said all that so yeah we ran the football and ricky leach is one of the toughest sobs i've ever seen because you know the quarterback has to hold that ball on that pitch to the last second and he's getting cracked every time <laughs> just as he releases it and here's a guy you know we're averaging 15 throws a game and here's a guy you got a guy that not only is Rick Leach is a tough SOB, but he's got a great arm and he's a lefty and he plays 11 years in Major League Baseball. And where do they put the best arm in baseball on the field? In right field. He's a right fielder because he's got the best arm because he can make the two longest throws, third and home. And we never let him throw. In fact, when we're out in the Rose Bowl, you know, we're down losing in the Rose Bowl and we're still in an I formation. We don't have a drop back pass. We're down by touchdowns, and we're still going to play action pass with only two receivers in the, in the route. And we still would win football games, but, you know, it was old school. Well, I didn't play in the Orange Bowl against uh, Oklahoma. I broke my leg uh, the week of the uh, Ohio State game, so I didn't play in the Ohio State game my uh, sophomore year. You North broke your leg in practice. In practice, yeah. Wow. And then it was just my fibula on, the, on my left leg, so it wasn't a bad break. 
but it didn't heal in time to play in the Orange Bowl. So I was lucky then not to have played against Leroy Selman, but he came <laughs> back because then we, him, him playing down at Tampa, you know, and because of geographical proximity, we would play him, it seemed like, every preseason and every regular season because they were just down the road basically in Florida. So I played against Leroy 10 or 11 times, and I played – and with him in five Pro Bowls, too. And I'm going to tell you something. He was an exceptional athlete. Yeah. And Oklahoma had a hell of, hell of a defense. And I think we only lost that game like 17-14. Then we went to USC, and uh, I think the quarterback was Vince Evans. Uh, the uh, Clay Matthews was on that team. Uh, Gary Jeter, who played for the Giants, was the defensive end on that team. Uh, Anthony Munoz was a tackle on that team. Uh, I think it was Charlie Taylor was their running back. So they had a hell of a team there too. And we, we were close to winning that football game and could have won that football game, but we didn't. Then we, you know, played uh, Washington in the Rose Bowl. And as you stated, Warren Moon was their quarterback. And, and what ended up happening in that game, and a lot of people don't know this, is, is that they ran every trick play they had on, on special teams in offense in the first half and basically got us down. I think we were down by two or three touchdowns at the halftime, if my recollection. But one of the things that people didn't realize is that Bo had rented a motor home with uh, equipment in there to go ahead and uh, take the, the, the game film from the first half and produce it so we could watch it at halftime. Wow. And because the halftime was 20 minutes long because of the halftime uh, show instead of 15 minutes. So we actually watched the first half of that game in the locker room and then came out and almost won it. We had a, if you look up the stats, there, we had like a record amount of offense in the second half and came from almost winning the game at the end there in uh, Ricky Leach through a pass, and it might have been Harlan Huckabee, I can't remember the running back, kind of caught it on the shoulder like here on the 10 or 8-yard eight, eight line, and the Washington defensive back picked it off his shoulder for an interception instead of it being a touchdown. And I think we needed to go for two, but we would have, and we would have got it, and we would have won that game, but we lost it. So, But those are, those are great, unfortunate memories. <laughs> so, so Bo was tech-savvy. I mean, that's impressive. I mean, I don't think there are a whole lot of people that know that. And to do something like that, I mean, yeah, it gave you guys a, a competitive advantage going to the second half. Well, in the Big Ten, and they, there were complaints about it because they got they uh, they found out about it, and Bo went, show me in the, in the rule book where it says <laughs> I can't do that. And they couldn't. But they did change the rule where you couldn't do it. You know, I tell people that Bo is a very hard man to work for. But there was nobody more loyal than Bo if you um, uh, basically performed under his regime. He stood by you not only as a player, but post, but your post-playing career. He, 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 he harped on people who hadn't graduated, when you're going to graduate, when you're going to come to school. Uh, if you have problems, personal problems or the financial problems, he was always there for you. So he was more like a dad. What I used to say about Bo, he took boys and, and molded them into men. And that's why I think that so many players who played for Bo at Michigan are all, most of them, very, very successful in life after the fact. I mean, you know, we've got two of my teammates who are, one's an orthopedic surgeon, the other one's a heart surgeon, you know, Dr. Kirk Lewis and Dominic Tedesco. And another one of our offensive line teammates, Jim Hackett, ended up being the CEO of Ford Motor Company after he left uh, that uh, office furniture company, which I can't remember the name of. I mean, it's just, uh, and even uh, your father-in-law, Roger Bettis, owns one of the biggest trucking companies in the state of Ohio. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of guys have been very successful and they're very loyal, not only to Michigan, but they all recognize what Bo did for them. Tedesco, he decided to go the medical route after having to go against you in practice all those years, huh? Yeah. <laughs> hey, he was a show, another Chicago guy. He knew the ropes. Yeah. So in 1978, you get drafted by the Falcons, 13th overall. Uh, you make the NFL all-rookie team alongside 
uh, Pops. Walton's on there along with Don Anderson. Um, some big time names on there: Ozzy, uh, Earl Campbell, James Lofton. Um, coming out, I guess you understand when you're you're the 13th pick what the expectations are. But in your in your wildest imagination, did you ever imagine that it was going to span 17 years, five Pro Bowls, five times uh, being an All Pro? Now, you know, I, I never had any aspirations as a kid or in college to play in the, in the NFL. I just liked competing and I liked playing football because of the high level competition. And things just kind of evolved, not only at the high school level and college, where I was, for whatever reason, you know, a little bit better than everybody else. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't have, uh, uh, you know, there was no uh what do you call it the, the, where they go in, uh, in indianapolis they uh the combine the combine there was no kind of combine back there there was no espn and there were no cell phones and so i mean you didn't have any email address so you used to have a pro day at the uh at the big schools and they would go to all the big schools including ohio state and uh like i said earlier you know uh Elliot Uzelak saw me play lacrosse and saw I run. You know, my 40 time on pro day is that I ran a 46740. Okay. They didn't believe it. So they made me run it again at a 469. So they said, okay, we'll give you a 468. <laughs> then we ran a 10 yard box drill. We run forward, karaoke to the left, go backwards, turn and run and complete it. The coach goes, he's time it goes, oh, that's pretty fast. I went, well, you know, I can actually run it faster. I was just warming up. He goes, no, you can't. I said, well, let me do it. He goes, okay. And I did. And he runs, he goes, holy crap, you ran that faster than every defensive back that we've tested so far. Wow. So I <laughs> could run. And I was the 13th pick, but there were two other offensive tackles picked before me in the draft. I was the third one, Gordon King. And a big offensive tackle out of Ohio State, Chris Ward, yep. were picked before me, and and uh, and and also the Atlanta Falcons were at that position left tackle were terrible. They had two players playing the position in 1977 that gave up like 24 sacks in one season. So when I got to camp, you know, they said, "Hey, this kid can't be any worse than what we already had in there." And I had a good camp. He says, well, they started me the very first preseason game, and I never did not start a game. And that was the beginning. And then I had to learn, you know, we went from throwing 15 passes a game to 40 passes a game, you know, drop back passes. And I really, to be honest with you, had to take what Jerry Handel told, taught me and took his foundation and had to adapt it to pass blocking because we didn't really pass block you know, at Michigan, it was all play action pass. So um, that's how it happened. And then I was fortunate enough to yeah, make the all rookie team that I made my first pro bowl in my third year um, in 1980, when we went to 12 and four, and then I made five of them in a row. And it was, uh, I was on track to make my sixth one in a row without question, because the two best offensive tackles in the eighties were myself and Anthony Munoz. Uh, and I blew my knee out the 11th game, but our winning seasons had ended. We had had three in the first five years, 78, 80, and, and 82. We had a losing season in 84 and a losing season in 85. And that was the beginning of a nine year losing streak. So I got hurt, didn't make the Pro Bowl. And like who are the Atlanta Falcons? They're not even breaking 500 every season. And if you don't have a winning season, you don't get consideration, you know, for those accolades. And then we got a new head coach, Jerry Glanville came back, who was my defensive coordinator, special team coach in my first uh, five years in the league. And uh, we the run and shoot, we, became, we started running the run and shoot, which is really just a spread offense with a slight half roll by the quarterback. A lot of people call it run and shoot. It's, the only reason they do that is to get an extra wide receiver out into the game. And the guy that's furthest away from the ball is unblocked. And the quarterback has a little bit more time to deliver the ball before that guy can get to him because he's unblocked. That's why they did it. And 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 uh, Jerry did get us back. And in the playoffs in 91, that was also the Deion Sanders era. 
And uh, I had my best season as an NFL player in my 14th season where I gave up one sack and I did it actually in the last game, which I'm still pissed off about <laughs> like, to a guy that didn't even deserve to be on the field with me. And I just lost <laughs> concentration on an inside move at towards the end of the game. You know, it might've been three minutes left and I gave up a sack or I had zero sacks that year. And so I, I was a consensus all pro made everyone you can make. And for some reason, I still didn't get voted into the Pro Bowl for the sixth time. I still don't understand that. You know, you're, you're, you're a former offensive lineman. You know, our biggest fear in pass protection is the hospital shot on the quarterback. So, you know. Yo, shit block. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I watched more film than any offensive lineman ever did. And I watched uh, a lot of film, not only evaluating myself, but evaluating the player that I was, uh, um, you know, playing against that day. And, and what I ended up determining, there's three kinds of pass rushers in the NFL. Uh, there's the predetermined pass rusher, which is a guy like Pat Swilling, where he predetermines before the snap if he, what pass rush he's going to do. He's going to do an upfield speed rush. Speed rush. He's going to do a, a bull rush with his inside spin. You know, he already knows he's made up his mind. Then there's the instinct pass rusher. Instinct pass rusher is like Lawrence Taylor or Bruce Smith. They don't know what they're doing. They're reacting to what's happening, and it's just instinct on, on what they do. They take advantage of what the, the offense tackle did or didn't do to go ahead and get by them, and they have great ability, too. The, other, the third one, and there's not a lot of these, is a setup artist. And the setup artist was Richard Dent. Richard Dent used to slow rush you, slow rush you, and slow rush you. And you always wonder, how, is, how did Richard Dent uh, – always have the neck at a crucial time during the game to get the big sack because he was setting the offensive tackle up the entire game going maybe 70 80 percent and all of a sudden it's a third and long at a crucial point in the game and all of a sudden where'd that come from and he gets the sack yeah. and i confirmed that through a teammate of his who played left end there because trace armstrong's a very good friend of mine i said trace richard's a setup artist isn't he, he goes you got it <laughs> So, you know, you, you just have to spend a lot of time watching film and you don't block every pass rusher the same. You don't. They're all different. Sometimes you got to go ahead and punch and release. Sometimes you go ahead and punch and lock. You know, other guys like with Leroy Salmon, you had to play him on the inside number because his arm over was so good. Uh, some guys you set firm. Some guys you got to set a little deeper. Uh, it just depends. So the things that I see, not only in NFL today and also in, in college today, one, nobody is applying the correct techniques and fundamentals that I know and that I learn. In fact, they're all doing it wrong and they're making their job so much difficult uh, in order to do their job because their feet, their outside legs are out, they're setting guys square instead of setting them on the inside number, you know. I, the guards are off the ball and also when they uh, the ball snaps they back up even further and you've got a 320 pound or 340 pound guy across from you the, work, the, the last thing that you want to do there is give that guy three or four steps of momentum and room he's going to win that battle you know you know you know offensive linemen most of them of big, strong guys who weren't athletic enough to play defensive line. If they were, they'd be a defensive lineman because that's where the better athletes are. That's just a fact. But there are some offensive linemen who are athletic and just didn't like playing the position. I consider myself one of them. But you know. so, so vice versa there, you're playing against a guy like Lawrence Taylor who's a little bit faster. You kind of want to get on, get on him a little bit quicker before he can get that momentum build up? Yeah, and, and Lawrence, the night, and, and by the way, Lawrence said Taylor never got a sack on me. So, okay. Lawrence Lawrence didn't get on a real wide uh, thing. Lawrence usually played kind of tight. Um, but, you know, he had very explosive speed. But I would go ahead and take Lawrence early inside out, punch him and release. Okay. Uh, guy like Charles Haley. Um, Charles always, he was wider and he would give up his chest. And there was always a moment there and he was a punch and release guy. Uh, you know, there are other players, you know, who um, if a guy had a really big a bull rush, you know, you want to take him early. 
yeah. you want it. You, you want to take them early and you want to lock. And so it just depends on the individual. You know, Bruce Smith was one of the most dynamic guys I ever played against. And the guy was really remarkable. He's in the same class as LT was, and he ended up playing a very long time. Uh, you know, Bruce was like, blocking him was almost like doing a ballet because there, I mean, he was all over the place. So if an offensive tackle didn't have a really good foot speed movement, they're going to have a hard time with a guy like that. Then you had a Derek Thomas. Derek Thomas was just a speed guy, but damn, he was fast. So you had to set deep on him, but you still had to maintain inside protocol because he would come inside. You didn't ever want to get square on him because if you get square on an offensive uh, a defensive lineman, you give him a two-way go. And you want to take the inside out. So you always set all of them, regardless whether you're a guard or a tackle with your head on their inside number. Uh, so it just depends. I mean, the 46 defense, you know, they were the only team in the NFL to be running it, you know, under Buddy Ryan. And then when Buddy went to Philadelphia, Philadelphia was the only team running the 46 defense. And the way that defense worked is that you had to, put maximum pressure on the quarterback because your defensive corners were playing man to man. And so you had to get to the quarterback to get him to throw the ball early or get sacked and get the ball out. And if, and it was so hard in the, in the people they had up front from Richard Dent to Dan Hampton, to Steve McMichael, to, uh, you know, what, uh, I can't remember which one, the outside linebacker, but Mike Singletary, I mean, they had a hell, a hell of a defensive front. I mean, that one was as good as the one when you went up to Philadelphia when you had Reggie Wright and Brown and, and all those guys playing at the, on the Philadelphia defense. But And since they were the only team in the NFL running that defensive front, I mean, offensive coordinators had to go ahead and change their entire game plan because it wasn't a traditional defense. They had to change the whole blocking scheme on pass and run just for that defense. Because what you were doing traditional wasn't a traditional defense. You couldn't use what you were doing. And so that was a challenge too. But they had a great team. I mean, you know, I love Jim McMahon. He was a hell of a quarterback. But they used to tell Jim McMahon, he says, just don't turn it over and we'll win this football. Right. Because <laughs> they had the highest turnover ratio on defense, I think, in history. I mean, they were, they didn't score a lot of points, but nobody scored. So you and Lomas have the, the career record for most starts at offensive tackle. Yeah. And we're the only two offensive tackles. We have 251 starts and we're the only two offensive left tackles to play over 200 games. There's only one other offensive tackle who's got more than 200 starts and that's Jackie Slater. And he's either got 211 or 215, but he was the right tackle. So there's only three of us. So if, if you're going to think of a category to uh, place offensive tackles or offensive linemen in general, I mean, that right there has to be a measuring stick. I mean, the, the durability, uh, the accountability, the respect from your, your, your coaches, um, to be able to start that many games. I mean, it's just, to me, outside of the Pro Bowls and the, and the All-Pro selections, I mean, it really doesn't get any bigger than that. And there's a lot of other names underneath 251 that are walking, that are, that are in the halls of Canton. Well, there is. And, you know, what, what, the, what the, the inductors look at uh, from the Hall of Fame is they look at games played. Well, games played is not games started. Games played is that, like, and I'm not throwing Jackie Slater on the bus. I know he's a good friend. Jackie Slater didn't start until his like his third year in the NFL, if not his fourth year. And then the last couple of years that uh, uh, he was in the NFL, he was just playing on an extra point and field goal. He wasn't even playing, but that's still a game played. So he's got like 265 games played or whatever it is, but his starts are only like 211 or 215. You're on the field, but you're really not playing, playing the game. Um, so when you go ahead and look at games started, and, uh, you know, all the offensive tackles that are in uh, the Hall of Fame, there's only one who has over 200, and that's Jackie Slater. The rest of them are less. Joe Thomas uh, up in Ohio, uh, he doesn't have 200 games started. Right. 
All right, man. Before I get you out of here, let's do a little rapid fire. All right. All right. Okay. Falcons, you're playing at home. Red or black jerseys? White jerseys if we're outdoors. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> when Glanville came here and switched us to black jerseys, I, I said, I said to Jerry, I said, Jerry, black jerseys, black helmets. You know, we play in July and August here in the preseason, and it's still in the 90s in September, and we're in black jerseys at home. What the hell are you thinking about? So white jerseys. Best offensive lineman you've ever seen with your own eyes? Outside of yourself. Anthony Munoz. Best defensive lineman that you ever went against? The one guy that, at the end of the day, you said, you know what? This guy can give me some fits at times. Well, both of them always did. Uh, I'll, I'll name two, Bruce Smith and Leroy Selman. Pre-game music, man. Uh, you a music guy. Uh, what what uh, what were some jams that really kind of uh, bands that really kind of just put you in that focus and, and locked you in? ACDC. Favorite pre-game meal, something you had to eat before you went out there and battled? Uh, I'd like to eat, I like to eat a steak and not spaghetti because carbohydrates made you tired. So I ate protein. Pro Bowl format. You like the old school uh, out there in Honolulu or how they're kind of doing it here in New Modern Era before the Super Bowl? Uh, you know, I understand. You know, back, back then, um, it was old school because actually, you know, you know, the 15,000 to the losers and 25 grand to the winners was actually meaningful back then. Now they're playing flag football because, and, and I would, <laughs> with the amount of money a player's making today, today, when you got an offensive tackle, left tackle today, I think the highest paid one's making $18.5 million a year. Why am I risking my career on a game that doesn't mean anything? So, uh, you know, I would prefer to play under that format because maybe that meant that I'm making eighteen and a half million dollars a year. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's where you get some of those heated battles between uh, uh, Rogan and Neil Smith, and you get a couple of those those uh, those extracurriculars under the bottom of the pile. Had a little bit more meaning back then. Um, if you could pick one guy, and 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 we'll put the disclaimer out there that you know you're not you're not being picky here, but because uh, you love all your teammates, but. If you could pick one guy to line up next to you at guard, who you want to go into battle with? The best guard I played with was R.C. Thielman, who ended up leaving Atlanta and going to play for the Redskins and played in that Super Bowl with the Hogs when Doug Williams won the Super Bowl for him. Hi, I'm Jim Ballard, College Football Hall of Famer. And after a long night of commentating the game on Q92, love to fire up a big cigar. Just head on down to the Scar Lodge, located at 2989 South Main Street. It has 40 TVs, brand new patio, pool tables, massage chairs, golf simulator, private meeting rooms, anything you could ask for. Not to mention the extensive collection of bourbons and whiskeys, and of course the cigars. Stop down and enjoy your day or evening with Doug Green and his phenomenal staff. Cigar Lodge, located right around the corner from Firestone Country Club. Check it out. Here we are again on another episode of 1372 show, the QB and the OG in it to win it with the QB who can spin it. Jim Ballard, I'm TJ Downing, and we're joined by a special guest here today at a special location here at the Cory Golf and Event Center right off of Route 30 in Trump Avenue here at 5650 Cory Lake Drive. And our special guest today, Executive Vice President of Public Affairs for the Hall of Fame Resort and Entertainment Company, Ann Graffis. Ann, we appreciate you taking time to come and join us today. Thank you for having me, Ann. It's my pleasure, especially out here today. It's oh, you, you can't you can't beat this. I know we, we probably don't have many more of these left, so we're going to take them where let's, we can get them. Let's take it in. We're all from Ohio or remotely close. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is definitely one of the prime days of fall. We um, we had a chance to catch up when uh, we'll let you kind of shine a little light on your team here for a second. But we had a chance to catch up with Maddie Zerikowski last week, and we told ourselves, we're like, okay, we love the inside of Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium in the press box, but we know we're not going to have many more days <laughs> like this. So let's go to the rooftop and hang, and hang out at the I sky knew box. I you were smart, <laughs> TJ. Now I know just how smart you are. Yeah. Hey, talk real quick, too, before we get into Maddie and, and your PR team, um, how things have been going with the uh, Thirsty Thursdays up there on the Sky Terrace. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking. Uh, really, what a neat idea to really allow us to open up that rooftop to uh, the public. And it's been wildly successful. We have sold out. Uh, for the events that we've hosted and so we have each time looked at the next time and what we can do to enhance it 
we listen to feedback, we do maybe something a little bit different. Um, so you can expect to see many, many more of those based on the fact that we've been quite successful. And it's just a unique space. I mean, there isn't anywhere in the county, quite frankly, where you can get up on the rooftop and see the entire city of Canton in all its glory. And on a great night, I mean, there's nothing better. Live music, you know, DJ, we've got Q92 up there. So it's a really unique opportunity for our community to come together, hang out with friends, have a great night, enjoy each other, and enjoy a beautiful stadium. You talk about the space. Uh, I mean, it, it's huge. There's so much to do. You can walk around. It's not one of those spaces where you, you feel claustrophobic. I mean, it just keeps going and going because it is on the top of the stadium. Mm -hmm. And like you said, to be able to, to look out and and see the field and look at the highway and everything that's going around, um, that's going on at the uh, Hall of Fame Village. It's, it's, it's just an awesome space. And like you said, it, it has to be wildly su successful because it's so cool to be there. You want to be there and, and, and take it all in. Mm -hmm. Well, what's unique uh, now is that from that space, you can actually see every time we do an event, the change in the landscape as it relates to the construction and all that we're doing as a project. But even better, I mean, there are cabanas and it's a really relaxed, you know, comfortable setting too. So. If you want to go out and have a great time, that Thursday Thursdays is just a really fun, uh, cool, engaging environment. When I first walked up there, I kind of felt looking over at the cabanas like I was at a nightclub out in <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> right. And so nobody around the area that I know of can get a party like that going other than Nicolina, the midday oh diva over at goodness. Q92. Talk about the partnership oh. locally with that radio station who Jim and I have worked for now for, I've been there over seven years, and Jim, I think you're on year number four, but... Uh, with Q92 Sports and how we've kind of developed that. But Nicolina, she's been a staple there, and she does such a great uh, job getting everybody involved. How lucky we are. I mean, a personality like that, a talent like that in Nicolina, I mean, she's just tremendous. And so to partner with Q92, the Petersons, I mean, when you talk about making sure that we foundationally have the right people around us, it doesn't get any better than that, and it just makes perfect sense. And so we're incredibly grateful for the continued partnership of folks like the Petersons in Q92, and I mean, Nicolina just makes the night yeah. that She's much She's the more icing fun. on top of the cake. She really Great. is. I mean, if you come out for anything, you would want to come out just to meet her and be with her. And yeah. She had the girls at the football game, oh the right. Women Alliance football oh game, right. the national right. championship. Right. She had them in the post party. Oh they're right. doing dances oh yeah. and they're TikToking. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she knows <laughs> how to get a party footage. started and keep it going, quite frankly. So we just couldn't be more thrilled with that partnership. It, it really is uh, something that just made sense through conversation. And um, Honestly, Q92 has been supportive of what we've been doing as a company mm -hmm. from the start, and we couldn't be more grateful. Um, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, when you talk about shining a light on your team, uh, a lot of young people who, that's kind of our target audience at Q92. We have a huge following mm -hmm. at the high school level, but um, some of the young people that are on your team, talking to Maddie, and, and she's just, what, I believe two or three years removed from Kentucky, mm -hmm. and she's kind of talked about how there's, there's been a flow of young people that have taken interest and that are working underneath you and inside of your PR team that just love working for the company and seeing everything grow. Well, I, I appreciate her saying that, and it makes you feel good as someone who is, you know, trying to lift up, a, you know, what is essentially a startup. Uh, we were, you know, a year old as a publicly traded company on July 2nd, so it's incredibly gratifying for me, and I know all of our uh, team to see young people come in and want to be part of something really special. So, you know, I if you're smart, you hire folks that can take your position ultimately someday or, you know, maybe someday soon, but you want to surround yourself with incredible talent. And, you know, young people in our area specifically speak to that, and there's so, so much great around us. Uh, you know, Maddie is locally, you know, mm -hmm. uh, she came from here. Uh, she did go to the University of Kentucky, and I actually had her as an intern when I was at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So I got to know her and her skill set. But, you know, that we all need to be investing in the youth in our space mm -hmm. so that we can see something really great uh, happen for us collectively for tomorrow. So, I mean, I've always loved having young interns. They have great ideas. If you really just take the time to ask the questions and really listen, um, they literally can help catapult what you're doing in some really creative and unique ways that we as folks who might be stymied and in spaces for too long haven't thought of or even considered. So I've always been a huge fan of young people around me, surrounding myself with different opinions and ideas, and our, our company has absolutely embraced that. When you think back, or I think back to college, uh, uh, Jim Trussell, my head coach, he always had a saying, you win with people. Mm -hmm. And you talk about that, the foundation, winning with people. And going back to my college days, it's funny that uh, you two actually go back to college <laughs> days with each other. You guys got to talk about that. That's we're pretty cool. You guys are both graduation years or anything like that, are we? <laughs> no, no, we're not. But t talk about, um, you know, I've had a chance to cover Mount Union football for a long time. Talk about the Alliance community, going to school there. 
I mean, obviously what the godfather over here was able to do, you know, uh, bringing that first national championship. And from there, I mean, Alliance and the campus of Mount Union looks completely different. You can tell how the sport of football has impacted that, that campus. You can't even. Uh, it, it's not. The, it's obviously not the same school that we went to. Probably doesn't even look close. It's not even close. And with, you know, the additions of all the all the buildings, Chris Chickenelli from Pure Romance as the CEO has donated money for the press box. It's changed. You know, uh, Dom Capers just donated a bunch of money for uh, football only for the the meeting rooms and uh, the you know, the new practice field that's out there. And I mean, the facilities for a Division three school are, are incredible. And you know, like right. like I said, it's it's not even close to the to the school that we went to. It was, I believe, what twelve hundred kids when we were well, there. 1500, now, fifteen hundred, right? I now there's twenty five. When I was a student there, right? So, and I'm born and raised in Alliance. So, I mean, I've known the campus since I was born, essentially. And, you know, I grew up with the Karras family. So, what an incredible gift um, to be given to have that type of presence in your life. And quite frankly, I mean, I'm sure that you would agree with me when I say, you know, us having Coach Karras at the helm, Larry Karras, that is, for so many years, was an absolute uh, gift uh, to the school, to the community. Um, his integrity and his ability to uh, lift young people across the board um, was, I, I, you can't compare that. And I'm sure you, yeah. you feel the same about Jim Trestle, but then, you know, comes along Vince, walks in his footsteps, and now I'm just so excited to see Jeff Dart there. Yeah. Uh, the son continuing, in continuing, yeah, that tradition. So hopefully, bring you know, number fourteen oh this yeah. year, right? You know, in the school too. I mean, <coughs> it, it were it not for football putting Mount Union on the map, but you know, as far as you know, integrity of the education, it's top notch too. I mean, I think it is. It's always consecutive years of you know making the list of top schools. U.S. And News and World Report, and, yeah. and you talked about it, Ann. <coughs> Coach Karras's uh, contributions, and and the first thing everybody wants to say is. You know, we want to talk about the win streaks of 54 games or 55 games is 92.9% winning percentage. <laughs> but it's all the things I mean, it's that. greatest of all time. I mean, <laughs> I mean it, you know, he's so pretty so good. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about it. Happy you know, talk about that. 11 <laughs> national championships, no, no big deal. Guys have played in the NFL, and uh, his relationship with Dom Capers is pretty cool. Yeah. You know, Dom was a longtime staple in the he NFL. He has hundreds of former players that coach. Hundreds. The, the tree, and we, we, we talked about this on one of our podcasts. And they, they said that Miami, Ohio was the cradle of coaches. It, I, I need that investigated. There needs to be a 30 <laughs> for 30 done <laughs> on Mount Union and the coaching tree that is Larry Karras. And um, as you said, and his, what he's meant to us as players, uh, the way that he impacted us, the, uh, you know, you can go through all the different players that he's touched. And, you know, he was also the athletic director and the things that he got done for the school. And, you know, the different th things that, that got accomplished on campus was all because of Larry Karras and his impact. Just you, you can't even measure it other than on the, on the field and wins and losses. But and he's a quiet giant. I mean, he's, he's a quiet giant, but what an incredible leader and um, a maker of men. You know, we, we all grew up, you know, with him helping us become the men that we are and the coaches and dads and fathers and husbands that we are. I mean, a lot of that is because of the time that he spent with us and uh, his ability to to get the most out of players. And, and the one thing he did when he was in college was he took a lot of psychology classes not to understand how to coach players differently. Because, mm -hmm. you know, back then it was like, you're going to coach this guy the same way you coach this guy, this guy, this guy, Not this everybody guy. can do the yelling in their face. That, that type of stuff just doesn't work with some guys. And he just, he understood how to deal with certain players. And, you know, some players you'd get in their face and he knew that you'd get pissed off and you'd want to, you know, get back at him, but you'd play harder for him. Some people, or some kids, you know, he'd put his arm around like, listen, man, I know you're working, but I need this from you. Mm -hmm. He just had that ability as, as a coach to bring the, the best out of you. Mm -hmm. So we've officially started up two 30 for 30s today. We got one on Mount Union. We got one on the London Monarchs. Mm -hmm. You and Brad Johnson <laughs> started up a 30 for 30 <laughs> earlier today about all the guys that, uh, that went to the NFL. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, and the coaching tree, I mean, it's just – it's unbelievable. You know, obviously most recently with Nick Sirianni taking over the Philadelphia Eagles – and it just completely just is a spider web, and, and it roots out. And it's it's cool to see. I mean, Alliance was the thing back in the day in the, in the early 1900s. I mean, that was a huge hub. And to see how, you know, football has kind of – we've gotten so much out of Alliance throughout the country, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty phenomenal. Here's a little nugget for you. The oldest college football stadium it's in Mount the state Union's. of Ohio is, yep. is Mount Union. A lot of people don't know that. I didn't know that. Right. Um, 
it's pretty fascinating. The, you know, we used, to, we used to play Akron U at Ohio State back in the day. Yep, yep. Here, here on the 1372 show, my partner always tries to take a little shine away from my Buckeyes down there in Columbus. <laughs> we don't have the oldest stadium. I believe the Buckeyes actually came up and played a game oh, yeah. at Mount Union Stadium they back then because they didn't have their own, and they would meet halfway in between the, the teams that they were playing. So that's uh, it's a pretty cool deal, and, and it's really nice to see what's going on out there. Here on the 1372 show, the QB and the OG, joined by special guests today from the Hall of Fame Resort and Entertainment Company, Ann Gravis, the Executive Vice President of Public Affairs. So um, when we start to talk a little bit more about partnerships, um, there's one that's been formed with the NFL Alumni Association that their headquarters will now be inside of the Constellation Center for Excellence. Mm -hmm. You also have partnerships locally with Hendrickson with their name just going up uh, inside of the stadium. Also, what's going on with the scoreboard. Um, talk about how that works out, how that shakes out when you guys are in meetings, when you guys are kind of in the war room saying, okay, these are the type of people that we want to be aligned with. How does that shake out on a local level and a national mm -hmm. level? That's a great question, and, you know, certainly it takes – greater minds than mine that you know come together but uh it is it is something that you have to absolutely consider and have a, a level of discernment about right so when you are building a company and we are building this from the ground up there are different categories of opportunity that exist and so when you talk about this on a global scale you know you have a johnson controls obviously came in and partnered with us on the village and named the the village and what that means for us as a company is that their efficiencies and what they provide is by way of product um, is actually going to be incorporated in all things that we do on our campus. And so essentially then what we become is a model home for them and what they share with the world for others to come and see. So how does Johnson Controls look as it relates to a stadium, a hotel, uh, a restaurant concept, a water park as it will be? Um, and so we're incredibly uh, grateful, again, for that partnership. But other categories such as uh, food and beverage. Uh, AVI is another one of our wonderful sponsors. You know, they're locally sourced. They're from Youngstown. The Piavilas family, amazing support to us. And, you know, what they bring to the table is uh, culinary expertise for our concessions uh, and, and our catering. And so, you know, what we do is we look to um, where it makes sense, partner with folks that are in our backyard, because if we aren't doing that, shame on us, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then beyond that, what categories do we need to fill and who's best in class? Because what we are building is a company rooted in excellence and so that all that we do really needs to be reflective of that. And so we really do, uh, we're very deliberate about it. And so the folks that come to the table um, come from around the world nationally and then they come from our space here in Stark County and beyond. But, you know, we really feel like uh, it's a wild opportunity for us to uh, see the best and brightest amongst us shine in a in a company that's multi-tiered uh, and then bring in globally things that folks maybe potentially don't have access to uh, to our site because it just makes sense given the nature and the scope of our project so you're right uh, folks like Hendrickson I mean we're so excited and I could go down a whole list of mm -hmm. folks, but Constellation obviously sponsoring the Center for Excellence, the building that you see in what the West End building. Zone. What a beautiful building. I mean, what a better partner in the energy you know, company and the, the way they've been able to help us understand how we can be more efficient on our grounds, you know, that'll be reflected. And so we also then for them become that show place. So couldn't be more excited about what that's going to look like as the, you know, the, uh, the footprint is built out. Uh, but then you look at like Ashula's. Who makes better sense to have a restaurant concept? You know, I, you, I'm sure everyone's been to a Shula Steakhouse, but you know, to bring one right where Coach lives in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and we're proud to honor him. You know, that just makes great sense. And so, you know, local. It's a nice combination of local people coming together uh, and local businesses, and, and we've been very purposeful about that. You know, I'll I'll give a shout out to Robertson Heating and Supplies out of Alliance. Yep. You know, they help connect us uh, with. Uh, you know, plumbing fixture. So, you know, we're looking to make sure that where it makes sense, we can bring in people. I say bring them into the family uh, because really that's essentially what it becomes um, to make sure that the company is reflective of excellence on, a, uh, on all fronts. And there's so much excellence among us. I mean, yeah. we're from here. We get it. So I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue <laughs> past the Don Shula stuff on him, uh -oh. though, because Don Shula <laughs> was the guy that told him that he couldn't play in the oh, NFL. Right? So oh, I didn't know. Oh, you cut me. It was the first team I went, went to was the Dolphins. <laughs> he asked me if I had a back. <laughs> Do you have a backup plan? I said, yeah, I'm going to be a teacher and a coach. He's like, good, because I don't think you can play in this league. Oh, no. oh, I'm sorry. You Heartbreak yeah, hotel yeah, right there. That, that one hurt. Yes. Clearly, he hasn't gotten over that yet. No, 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 I don't think you get over something like that. <laughs> still, therapy, still in therapy about it.